Okay, good morning, everybody. I think that we are live. So welcome to this week's virtual plant clinic. My name is Bill Lester. I'm with University of Florida Extension Service here in beautiful Hernando County, which is in West Central Florida. For anybody watching us either live or recorded and you're not familiar with exactly where Hernando County is, um, I'm in technically Brooksville at the moment, but we have Brooksville, we have Spring Hill. So it's a happening place. And joining me today is one of our Master Gardener volunteers and kind of my uh, regular co-host recently, Bernie. Good morning, Bernie. How are you doing? Good morning, Bill. And also joining me today is our new, you're still new, so we'll call you new for a little bit longer, I guess. So our new Florida Friendly Landscape Coordinator, Colby. How are you doing, Colby? I'm doing well. Great. So for anybody watching us live, if you have any kind of lawn and garden questions, um, comments, somebody has a comment at least, a good morning. Uh, maybe you could share where you're watching us from because we do have a lot of regulars on here. We kind of, I have an idea of where you live, but every week we have new people on here and it really helps if we have an idea of where you live at because if you ask us how do i when do i fertilize my mango tree and you're watching from jacksonville we have a problem because jacksonville's probably too cold to grow mangoes you're going to have issues so it really helps us to be able to answer your question if we have an idea of where in florida you are good morning Corey. thank you for being so specific that really does help us tailor our answers more accurately so we will keep that in mind so corey's questions are coming from the couch like if you're growing you. things in your couch you might have other issues <laughs> yeah we have a lot of issues i guess to go over today guys so so monique is in downtown brooksville you know buddy is up is our regular follower from up in the panhandle up in tallahassee is it getting chilly up there yet we're getting down to about 70 at night really not much colder than that and Corey is in north pasco which is in a cold spot although it ain't cold yet so and bill is from spring hill so we got people from all over on here today so guys if you have any lawn and garden questions Feel free to ask them. Let me go ahead and start by sharing something that came into our office yesterday. Um, many of you might remember about a year or so ago, the big stink about murder hornets, which is a species of very, very large hornet native to parts of China that they detected in parts of Washington state. And I believe they only found really one nest out in the wild and they cordoned it off and eradicated it and took care of it. I don't think they've had any other confirmed sightings or findings of colonies or it's spreading or anything. But then everybody was in a panic about murder hornets. They're in my yard. They're coming to my state. And they have not been found in Florida at all since they were first found. And now we have another species of large bee. It's a large, colorful hornet that's also from China, I believe, or parts of Asia. And it's the, um, what is it, the yellow-legged um, hornet. Let me look at all my different pictures I have here. And that was found in Georgia. And they've tried to um, wall off where it is and you know, cordon it off and search and go out there and take samples and hunt for it. And it has not been found in Florida. But sometimes we get people who see the news reports and they think, oh my gosh, it's probably here. It's probably in my yard. So I'm going to go outside. I'm going to hunt. And I'm going to catch every big bee in my yard because everyone has to be a murder hornet, right? And they are not. So what we have been getting brought into our office, either ideally from pictures, but sometimes with actual samples, 
this, let me get it right up in the camera there, is a large bee that was brought in. And it's very colorful. It has yellow stripes in this abdomen. And it's pretty big. It's a good inch if it's straightened out inch, inch and a half long. And that is the poor Eastern Cicada Killer, which is a native bee here in Florida. It's supposed to be here. The adults go out and catch cicadas. Cicadas are also called, what else are they called? Locusts. They're the things up in the trees in the summer that make all the noise in the evening, all the chirping noises. So these wasps catch them take them down into their holes in the ground because they live in little holes, well, fairly big holes in the ground. The, the hole is going to be about as big around as your thumb. And they take the cicada down there and they lay their eggs in it. So these bees are supposed to be here. Please don't go into a panic and start thinking that every bee slash wasp slash hornet on your property is some kind of horrible invasive that's going to uh, attack all of us and carry us all away. Yes, that is, um, technically that's a wasp. And that's, a, those are all just common names. It's that each wasp or hornet or bee kind of goes with the group of families that uh, the, the insect in question is a member of. And yeah, if you, if you live usually out in the country and usually in a really sandy area, you'll see holes in the ground and sometimes you'll see the bee come flying up and go into the hole in the ground or maybe they come back out out of the hole and fly away. They're really large and they're really impressive and they might be frightening, but they're not dangerous. Now, if you catch one, catch one in your hand and start poking at it, they can sting you and they probably would. So don't do that. If you don't do that, you're good. If you just leave them alone, everybody's fine. But these bees are native and not to be feared. We encourage people to always, if you see something really unusual, say something. But try to get pictures or a really, really good description. Or maybe you can see something, look it up online, and then line it up with the picture. Um, if you ever do find something and you have a sample, get a hold of us. We send pictures off to the state of Florida, off to the experts with everything from bees to snails to other potential invasives. So, so keep watching, but please don't start catching every big bee and bumblebee and little bee and everything else in your yard and drag them in here to the office because so far none of them have been really, you know, dangerous uh, ones that we're on the lookout for. Now, Bill, yes, sir. You know, that's, that's one of the things I get a tremendous number of questions about, uh, because our area is pretty much all sandy soil, uh, people want to know what all the little mounds are. Uh, if, if you don't have a paved driveway uh, where where the uh, car has, has cleared away the, the grass, now, they'll always have these little mounds pop up. And, and uh, there's two or three uh, insects that do that. That is very, very common. And... Uh, None of them are, are really out to attack people at all. So um, you've probably seen them and, and not realized it, but uh, these, these little mounds of, of sand, small mounds, uh, are, are quite often the cicada killers or, or some of the other family members that also live. These sure, we people. have a bunch of different native species of different bees that live in holes in the ground. Uh, it could be a uh, mole cricket. Uh, we do have a beetle that if you see little mounds, and we get them right in front of our office every year. If you get little mounds outside in February, it's a specific species of beetle. And none of these things are really dangerous or harmful. All of them, if you basically leave them alone and let them come and go, they're not going to cause a problem. Uh, the only exception would be yellow jackets and they make large colonies. They live out in the woods and they will all come pouring out of the hole in the ground because lots of them live in the ground and they will chase you and sting you and probably injure you. So yellow jackets are something different. All the other individual solitary insects that make little holes in the ground and live there. I can't think of any that are particularly dangerous. 
Can you? No, I, I love the little pyramid, inverted pyramid holes with the insect hiding down in the bottom, waiting for it, an insect to walk along and, and slide down in the bottom. And uh, the, the interesting thing there is that that's the larvae of, of what looks like a, a small dragonfly later on. So you see these little black uh, miniature dragonflies flying around in your yard. That's that's what's at the bottom of those little pyramid, inverted pyramid holes. I think that's, they're kind of neat, kind of cute. Yes, they are. And they are ant lions, and I have them in my yard. Uh, here, let me share my screen here real quick. Let me find the correct tab here. Okay, these are ant lions, and we have a number of different species here in Florida. We do have this one, and this is one of the adults, and you'll see them flying around at night around porch lights and backyard lights. Um, and it has a big splash of kind of pinkish purple on its wings. And this is what the immature one looks like. Very, very scary, but not dangerous. That's what the, the bottom of that little conic hole. And uh, they don't have a picture of one of the holes. But, you know, I see that question all the time on Facebook. People put a, a picture up on one of the guard, gardening or in, insect groups. And they ask, what are these little holes in my backyard? They're just ant lines. Totally, totally harmless. Very, um, very neat little insect. Yes, yeah, so it's deep digger beetles that um, show up in generally in February. So that's the time of year where there's not a whole lot of insects outside. And we get we always get them right out in front of our office. I wrote a blog post and shot a little video about that once before. And they don't hurt anything. It's a big black beetle. Doesn't hurt anything. Cindy's one of our regular followers from Pinellas County. And Diana says they saw wasps around our wood where we were prepping our dirt for carrots. Is it okay to spray them? Or what is the best way to keep them away? Because I get frightened. Hard to stay calm. Wasps can be frightening. <laughs> so um, if the wasp in question was just kind of one of our standard um, paper wasps, the ones that make nests around your front door, underneath your power meter, outside, up under the eaves of your house, it's okay to spray for them. You want to get the special spray that shoots 20 feet because you don't want to have to get up close and personal with them. They're not very friendly. So if you have a, a nest in a spot where it's going to injure you or somebody else, it's okay to take care of it. But those kind of wasps are very, very good if you have a garden because do you know what they eat, Bernie? No, I don't. The adult wasps will catch caterpillars. And oh. what? eats your plants in your vegetable garden caterpillars very good You're, caterpillars so these things are like flying bt or something then yes they are they're flying little they are all beneficial you may not think so if one is chasing you around or if you ever get stung by one you're not thinking it's a good beneficial technically it is in the environment they help to control caterpillars keep the populations under control so they're going to kind of help you with your battle against caterpillars on your plants. The uh, wasp spray is probably the fastest acting pesticide I've ever seen. It's one of those things that if you spray a wasp, it makes a 90 degree turn and goes straight down it. Uh, yep. <laughs> the uh, thing is totally effective, wipes out the uh, entire colony really quick. I, I have a ham radio operation in my garage and uh, there's a little hole by the door and I have mud daubers that come in and, and build little nests and 
there's always one or two mud gobblers flying around uh, while I'm sitting there using the radio. And I have found that, that they're actually uh, a, a very, very docile uh, mm -hmm. insect. Uh, they'll, they'll come over and uh, uh, maybe investigate me once a week or something. But for the most part, they fly around. They leave me alone. They, they, they make no attempt to hurt me. And uh, because they are beneficial, I, I finally leave them alone. It took a while to, to overcome the, the, the fear of having a wasp around because you, you're brought up. Almost everybody's taught that's a bad thing. Well, it really isn't. Same thing with the uh, big spiders we have in Florida. Yeah. You know, uh, it, it took a long time to get to where I could allow one of those to uh, stay near the entrance to the house or something, terrified that he was going to come in and carry me off in the middle of the night. But apparently they don't do that. They, they just sit there and, and eat bugs, and those are bugs that would end up in your house. So they're, they're mm. beneficial. But uh, the, the wasps, uh, it, it takes a, a lot of self-control uh, to be around them and not do anything. But as long as you're not messing with the nest, uh, it's very, very, very rare that they would sting you. The uh, paper wasps seem to be a little worse than the mud daubers, but the, the mud daubers seem to be very docile. I don't think uh, I, I don't I don't I don't think I've ever met anyone who has been stung by a dirt dauber like ever. But I have dev, I mean, those paper wasps will get you. They're a little bit a little bit more aggressive. Um, I've heard that if you plant uh, spearmint and thyme. Uh, I think there's a few of them that you can, a few plants you can plant that uh, the insects just don't like it. Uh, wasps and wasps specifically don't like it. Uh, maybe that's an option for keeping them out of your garden. But then again, you want to you eat your caterpillars. So Yeah, and there's no way that you can sanitize the great outdoors. You're going to have wasps. Mm -hmm. You just want to make sure that they're not in a spot where it's a danger to yourself or your family or children. I think I've always found them accidentally because they love to build nests on the undersides of palm tree leaves in hedges, in bushes. So if you have any kind of hedge, you're out there trimming it. You find the wasps the hard way when they fly out at you. Um, so every time I've ever seen a nest, I know not to get too close and they'll give you a certain amount of room. When you start getting close, you can tell they start moving and then one of them flies and starts to circle around. So, but they don't let you get too close before they take action to protect themselves. And of course, spearmint and thyme are both very, very good edibles to grow anyway in the herb garden. No, you don't really want to be near the nest. You know, uh, probably. Uh, three or four feet from the nest is, is pretty much safe with, with all of them. But uh, uh, if, if you're doing work right near the nest, uh, they're going to mistake you for uh, something that's after them. And uh, that usually has disastrous results. So I, I don't blame you. I, I wouldn't want them near where I was working either. Uh, but wasps are pretty sensitive to sound and movement. So if you're, you know, working and making a bunch of noise, uh, that's like, as you can walk by, you can walk right under. I walked under a paper wasp nest. I'm allergic to them, so I tend not to mess with them. Um, I tend, I just walked by it for so long, and never had an issue. But the second you get out there and start fiddling with something, moving a whole lot around it, you're you're liable to get liable to get bit or stung rather. Yeah, those, yeah. those spray cans will put it scream out uh, 10 <clears throat> feet easy so uh, you don't have to get too close if you're wanting to uh, eliminate the nest uh, uh, I've got a, a spray can that I was going to use and I, I normally only get rid of the nest uh, when I'm going to clean things up I'll, over the summer uh, I'll get probably 10 or 12 nests in the overhang of the house and uh, I'll go through at the very end of the season and, and take them out and, and clean everything up. But I'll, I'll let them go for most of the time. So they, they really aren't that big a problem if, if you don't do silly motions. If you, if you start swatting at them, you probably get stung. 
Deanne, Corey has a lot of partridge pea, and the wasps seem to love it. And when he grows tomatoes and peppers, they kind of bounce between those and my food plants looking for caterpillars to eat. I, I've, I've noticed them many times. You will see them out there flying around literally any kind of plant, just kind of checking things out and searching and hunting. And they're probably looking around for little caterpillars because they take the caterpillars and they sting them to paralyze them. They take them back to their nest. And that's what they use as a food source for their young. And it's part of the cycle of life out there. Butterflies and moths lay lots of eggs. And if every caterpillar survived, we wouldn't have a whole lot of green leafy stuff out there. They would pretty much eat it all. So wasps naturally balance the caterpillars and caterpillars naturally balance the plants and the weeds and everything naturally keeps itself in a pretty decent balance out there. And people have the worst problems when you throw something out of balance and then something else gets really out of whack. And now you're sending me emails or you're calling Bernie about why is this so out of whack? And if you start asking a lot of questions, you find out it's because they did something wacky sometimes. Yeah, they, they have sprayed so much uh, pesticide in this county uh, trying to cure a, a non-existent problem in the lawns that uh, we really have a, a bad situation that where there's a handful of, of insects that are a real problem that have no predators in in the county any longer and uh, i'm i'm just amazed that we haven't had any outbreaks it's uh you you, you can't just keep doing that year after year after year and, and not have some consequences in it. when it if it happens if it happens it's going to be disastrous it's, it's like when the, the grasshoppers um become so prevalent that they become locusts that, you know when it gets to that point now you've got a problem a few aren't aren't bad uh, but uh, a tremendous quantity becomes a, a nightmare so, you know. so but my hey, recommendation any... on the grasshoppers is just stomp on them throw them on the ground and <laughs> I always have some lovers in my yard and I really don't know why, because I've never really noticed them eating anything. There is, there's no plant or bush or I don't have amaryllis bulbs growing or anything like that. I've seen them even sitting on tomatoes before and they don't eat anything or damage it. So I'm wondering how are they getting by? But I just leave them alone. I don't let them bother me. I only have a few. Um, if I do ever have to do anything with them, like they'll get on the screen porch screening and my wife will tell me to get rid of them. I just go out there, I pick them off and I throw them over the fence. The neighbor gets them. So problem solved. Wow. Good for you, Corey. Corey said one year I grew out 4,000 peppers and tomatoes for resale and I used zero pesticide. I credit the healthy wasp population. If you have a healthy population of a variety of different beneficial insects, you make arrangements to plant the right plants to help attract them or provide them a certain amount of cover or pollen or whatever else they need. Uh, yeah, you can get a lot of beneficial pest control from beneficial insects. And even though it's difficult to not spray with anything, you can definitely reduce the amount that you spray. If you find yourself out there buying a lot of different toxic products and spraying a lot of stuff frequently, there's a problem. Like with people with lawns who have a service, if they're out there having to spray it every month with a pesticide or whatever, there's a problem. We don't, we shouldn't have that many pests. And if your lawn is so susceptible to things that you have to soak it that often with chemicals, we need to come up with a better plan. We need to, uh, you know, put in something else or, you know, that, that just isn't going to work long term. We, we all, that, that, that impacts and affects all of us. Can you imagine what the aphid population would be if there weren't things like ladybugs and a few other insects? I mean, they're, they're bad enough as it is, but 
without any any pests to help control those things would take over instantly they would well they found that um first of all with insects there's more species of insects than any other animal group and um if you put together the physical body weight of all the insects in the world, I don't know what it comes out. It's some ridiculous amount. So you might not think that we're surrounded by and literally buried with insects, but we are. So thought for today. See a comment we got about uh, seeing the wolf spiders um, at night and after not spraying, uh, wolf spires are incredibly beneficial and th th you got to kind of think about them. They don't, uh, they're scary. <laughs> they, they are a little scary, but you have to think they, they don't, they don't even make webs. So like they don't, there's no spider webs. They just crawl around and attack like mealworms and cockroaches and things like that. And certain things like aphids can asexually reproduce aphids are kind of a exception insect because they can give birth to live young spider mites reproduce like crazy uh and because of the genetics involved with mites a lot of insecticides become ineffective pretty quickly because mites are just unusual the genetics behind that, they, they very, very quickly start giving birth to predominantly individuals that are immune to the insecticide. So it's, it's not as simple as I'll get a can of Raid and I'll get a jug of this. And it's always going to work on all the insects that I want it to work on. It doesn't work like that. You, know, you were talking about wolf spiders. They, mm -hmm. they have a, a unique feature with their eyes in that they reflect light back at exactly the same angle it came to them. So you can go out at night, take a flashlight, put it right up by your head, and shine it around on, on the uh, lawn, and you see these little diamond-like reflections. And it's the eyes of wolf spiders. And I, I used to do night walks uh, at the nature center. And that was one of the things that we would do to uh, impress the, the people. Uh, we'd stop someplace in one of the little meadow areas and uh, start looking for wolf spiders. And, and they're everywhere. You, probably 90% of the lawns in, in Spring Hill, you can find wolf spiders. So uh, it really they is. They're in my yard. Hmm? They're out in my yard. A lot of times if I'm out working in the garden, I'll see them. I'll have to check the new yard at the new house that we just moved to. I'll, uh, I'll go out and do that tonight, actually. That's a good that's a good idea. <laughs> Not going to let my girlfriend know, though. I don't think she'd like to know about the spiders out there. <laughs> well, let's see. What, what have I taught my wife over the years? Um, when she sees a crane fly... Bernie, I know that you're familiar with crane flies. Colby, you know what a crane fly is? No, I'm not. I don't. I'm not sure. It's like a large mosquito with really, oh. really, really long legs. Yes, yes. She knows that they're not mosquitoes. They're mm -hmm. crane flies, and crane flies are not mosquitoes. Most times, if she sees a little beetle inside the house, she says, get a cup and catch him and move him outside instead of screaming, stomp on him kill him right now mm -hmm. so she's gotten better in that respect and even um we had uh one of the southern house spiders the big scary mm -hmm. looking ones and she saw him one day and she said get a cup so we very we caught him and very carefully moved into the bushes out front so she she's not she's not the see a bug stomp a bug or spray a bug kind of person anymore and you, you just have to Teach people and change perception mm -hmm. one by one by one. My uh, my girlfriend won't stomp the bugs anymore, but it is, oh, well, if I see a bug, then I'm not going on that end of the house till you go and find that bug and put it outside. And I'm like, this is fair. All right, that's a compromise I can make. I'll go, I'll go take care of the bug. Well, we have one right outside the front door. I have a queen palm tree. 
and they flower pretty frequently and they do make um berries or seeds on um, they're not edible or anything and for anybody with a palm tree if it flowers you can trim the flower off right away if you want to doesn't hurt the palm doesn't do anything bad to it i'm almost always like well behind on keeping the palm tree trimmed so sometimes the the, the seeds or berries will ripen and they fall down and I always have some on the ground underneath the tree. Bernie, there is a species of weevil that's maybe a half inch long. Very just if, if you see one, it's obviously a weevil. It has the curved head. And they feed on the seeds of palm trees. So sometimes I'll find one of them inside the house. I'll always have them because I always, I'm as long as I have the palm and it keeps I keep letting it drop seeds. I'm gonna have weevils out there feeding on the seeds. And every once in a while, they're going to sneak inside the house. So they don't bite. They don't hurt. Pick them up. Move them outside. <laughs> Queen palms in a, in a non-mode uh, environment uh, are almost an invasive plant now. They, they really reproduce uh, very, very well in, in Florida here. Those seeds will germinate. Yeah, so if you have a queen palm, let it flower. Save the seeds. They'll eventually turn orange. And if you try planting them, they'll sprout. You can you can start your own queen palm nursery pretty easily if you want to. Apparently the squirrels like the seeds because just about every tree that I've got within 30 or 40, uh, more than that, within a couple hundred feet of, of my queen palms has got a little queen palm growing up where uh, mm -hmm. the squirrel sat and ate the seeds. So. Uh, I've, I've got a lot of baby queens. If, if you need any palms, just let me know. I got a bunch too, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Somebody there's, there's another weevil that uh, gets in and, and eats the, uh, uh, the rachis, the stem of, of the frond. And uh, the fronds just suddenly drop down. And uh, when you get them on the ground, there's a big hole, like probably three quarters of an inch in, in the fronds. And uh, that's a very serious problem because there's no real way to treat it. The palm, uh, weevils? palm weevils? Yeah, we see them every once in a while. I don't have one handy. Um, it's a very, very, it's the largest weevil in North America. It's a very large beetle, and they will lay their eggs on the tip of a palm tree. What happens is palm trees, if you if they get damaged, if they get wind damage and leaves get ripped off, if you over prune them, or if they get hit by lightning, they give off a scent that palm weevils can smell. And a male palm weevil is going to smell your palm tree and come and land on it. Then he gives off a scent that attracts a whole bunch of female uh, palm weevils to the tree. And then more males show up, and they have a party up in the very top of your palm tree, lay eggs, and these beetle grubs, I've seen them, they're bigger than your pinky. They're about as big as this finger, I guess. I'm not making any gestures here. But this finger... They get a couple inches long and really, really fat. It is a huge beetle grub, probably fantastic for fishing, but it's a huge beetle grub, and they will chop the top growing tip of your palm tree, kills the palm tree. By the time you figure this out, don't ask what you could spray because it's too late. Too late, palm tree's a goner, not going to recover, not going to come back. And then all these beetles fly away to go find other palm trees that have been over pruned so hint hint don't over prune your palm trees makes them more um attractive to palm weevils and if your palm tree gets hit by lightning you can keep your fingers crossed you can hope for the best but it's not going to recover from that well one of the problems bill is that people will go out and they'll, their clean palm has got a couple of, of dead fronds and it's a problem to, to get them down so they, they go in thinking that if they take off 
10 prawns and, and, and move it up, that they won't have any dead prawns for a long time. Yeah. And, and, and it's a mistake because uh, palms are a, a unique plant in that they're not really trees. And they, they take all the nutrients out of the bottom leaf, out the bottom prawns, and put it into their new growth. So uh, as, as soon as you move it up, the bottom frond is now the one that's going to turn yellow next because that's where the new growth is going to come from. So uh, you, you don't save any time. I mean, it's, it's going to require the exact same amount of pruning no matter what you do to it. The, the big thing that happens is uh, the, the, the palms, I don't know the exact number on a queen palm, but say it's supposed to have 37 fronds, it works very hard to maintain 37 prawns. If, if you go in and, and keep taking 10 of them off where you're only running with 27 fronds, the trunk will narrow. And when the, the trunk narrows and, and the, the palm keeps growing, it now has a weak spot. And eventually it gets tall enough that you can't keep trimming it. So it goes back to the full size crown. Now it's got a big crown and a small trunk and it snaps off and and all this money that you spent over pruning it has made it weaker and killed it short into life and, and it's nowhere near as pretty so uh you know you really shouldn't take anything that's still green off of a palm tree anything that, that's green is going back into making the tree healthy so uh, all you're doing is, is uh, starving the, the new growth so be very yeah. very cautious you, you see a, a, a one of these tree people going down the road with, with a trailer full of green fronds they have been out committing uh some kind of political murder or not political <laughs> murder but some some type of, of of murder to the palm trees they really shouldn't have done it and and the people that are asking it to be done shouldn't ask to have it done. And the, the good ones, the, the people that are arborists and, and really know how to take care of plants are not going to come out and do that for you. So somebody shows up with a truck and says, hey, we'll do a hurricane cut and get rid of all those. Don't let them touch your plant. I have so many pictures of over pruned palms. I need to put together a little video montage Colby, if you want to help me with that sometimes, we'll put, it, sure. put together a video, find sure. some royalty-free music to throw in the background, and put some text about don't do this to your palm trees, because I have ridiculous pictures with There's so many that are the and it's just <laughs> and over like that is what I've seen is where the top gets. He was talking about the narrowing it ends up like this, and you have the top of the palm trees down at the bottom of the tree with it folded in half. I have a picture of where they were pruning a palm tree and there was a gentleman on top of a pallet <coughs> lifted up by a forklift mm -hmm. and he was standing. It, that's, we don't recommend that. That's very, very dangerous. You got to say like you wouldn't do this to your hair, you know, don't do it to your palm tree. <laughs> but if you drive around, that's how all palm trees mm -hmm. are done. Most of them for homeowners and pretty much all of them for commercial are done that way because they say, hey, I'll pay you to come out and trim prune my palm trees. I go, okay, well, how often do you want to pay me to do it? I'm only going to pay you to do it once a year. Take off enough leaves so it will hold until one year mm -hmm. later. So they take off all the leaves. And <clears throat> people who are new to Florida, they'll stand out there and watch them prune it, and they'll go, yay, it's only got one leaf. It looks so beautiful. It's so great. That's horrible from a plant health perspective. Horrible for your palm trees to do that. So that's you got to think those leaves are based are you know, kind of an oversimplification, but they're basically solar panels that power yeah, the tree. Yeah. And um, if you're taking them off, how is that thing supposed to grow to be strong and healthy? It's, it's not going to. It's going to die. And you have, and that causes nutrient deficiencies because, mm -hmm. like Bernie said, you know, the, the leaves move nutrients from the oldest leaves to the newer ones. And you keep taking too many leaves off. You're just pulling nutrients out. Then you're paying for fertilizer to put nutrients in. And you're spending tons of, you know, money and resources on watering them all the time. And then you pay a guy to get up in it and 
kind of undo all the things that you paid for and hoped for. So, mm -hmm. uh, so always a fun area of education. That mm -hmm. my wife see. Uh, brought home uh. some uh, fruit the other day. That it, it was a cross between a plum and an apricot. Very, very sweet. Really a nice fruit. Plum cod, probably. Well, it wasn't a plum cod. They, I, I forget what the name, what they, they were calling the thing. Uh, there there are some really neat crosses anymore. There, there's a plum cherry, which is a cherry about uh, twice as big as, as one of the, the really big cherries. So uh, I was just wondering... What are we doing in Florida to come up with with some crosses for the things that'll grow here, like our our pineapple bananas or whatever that we need? We have a greening resistant citrus tree. That's a start. <laughs> that took a while. But are yeah, they, before, you got, the, the before you all start asking, all the. Um, plum cots and apriums and all those things that are available in the grocery stores this time of year can't grow them here they all come from california so we have the wrong number of chill hours here in central florida so Anne marie is asking about the um palm tree seeds or fruits or berries or whatever you want to call it no on a queen palm they are not edible unless you are a squirrel the pendo palm, the the uh, fruits are, are pretty decent. Uh, they kind of remind me of that um, loquat tree. Uh, yeah, and Japanese plums. Yeah, we, we had one of those in my yard uh, when I was a kid. Yeah, and you can make jams and jellies out of them. Mm -hmm. They're pretty tasty from what I understand. Corey asks, what veggies are we starting or planting this week? Well, Corey, thank you so much for asking. Um, I started about a month ago pepper and eggplant and tomato transplants. They need to go into the ground. They're a little bit behind, but they can go into the ground in my garden and they will hopefully grow fast enough and do well enough so I'll get a crop before it gets cold because it's not going to get like cold, like uh, down to freezing or so cold for a while. We have some time left. And I'm starting seeds for all my different uh, cool season transplants. Um, things like bok choy and Chinese cabbage. And you can plant you can plant all those different cool season crops right now. And I'll throw this it. question out for you guys. What kind of natives should you be planting this week? Any of them, because you can plant them pretty much any time of year. Pretty constant climate we live in. <laughs> yeah, that's and, pretty much true of, of just about any any of the plants that you buy. If, if it's in a pot, you can put it in the ground uh, pretty much any time. There, there are very, very few exceptions to that. Um, it, it's when you're starting from seed uh, that it, it becomes critical. So... You know, if it's already in a pot, it's already in ground. It's just that's a small ground, so that you just move it to the bigger ground. And I went ahead and put uh, a little scroll at the bottom here for our freestanding web page. If you go to www.hernandoextension.com, all of our upcoming classes are listed there with all the details about whether it's free or there's a charge or it's on Facebook or it's on Zoom and when and where. And we pretty much record everything we do. So even if you miss it, you'll be able to catch the repeats. You know, this during the summer, you can catch the repeats if you miss the original broadcast. And um, we have a class coming up on Tuesday on growing edibles, edible plants in containers and I have over 200 people register for it at this point. So obviously a good topic. So if you guys want to join in, 
just go there the address and i'll leave it scrolling for a little while and bookmark that and keep checking that because that's the best way to find out what we all have going on at all of our upcoming classes uh and I have bernie, bernie i got a question for you here from diana about sand burrs or sand spurs and they're overtaking their yard but uh they're starting to get out of control where she can't pull them all we have a spray we plan to use post-emergent any other advice so what's the best way of getting rid of sand spurs and i know the answer i'm sure you know it too well the the, the first thing to do is get rid of the spurs and the, the easiest way to do that is to take a piece of carpet and drag a piece of carpet across the yard uh and and pick up the old spurs and and Sand spurs are a, a plant that really like a very poor condition. So the, everything you do to improve the, the situation uh, reduces the problem of sand spurs. But, but get rid of the spurs. Uh, and and uh, that is, that's probably the first thing to do if you're going to have dogs walking on the, the yard. And, and like I say, you, you can go buy one of these sample carpets is a little three foot square thing and uh, just pile a little rope on it and drag it across the yard and you'll be amazed how many spurs are on the <laughs> other side of that carpet when you turn it over yeah because those spurs are seeds for next year's crop and this is a question we get from a number of people this time of year every year Right now is the wrong time of year to control your sand spurs. If you want to get rid of the plants, they sprout in mid-February-ish here in Central Florida. So if you use a pre-emergent or erratic, pull them up and get rid of them very, very early, they're not going to make spurs next late summer. I've, I've talked to several people who said if they do that diligently, for one or two years, they've been able to totally eradicate where they have no sand spur. Do, do the pre-emergent in mid-January. We're, we're in a kind of an odd situation. It keeps getting warmer and warmer early. So uh, about mid-January is, is the, the time. If you go much later than that, they've already germinated and the pre-emergent doesn't do you any good. And then, then go in and uh, maybe late February, mid-March, uh, with a post-emergent. And uh, if it gets to 85 degrees three days in a row, it's too warm then to uh, do uh, any weed control. You, you start running the risk of, of damaging the lawn. Uh, even the, the things that are safe for St. Augustine with higher temperature still yellow out the lawn. So there isn't any really good... Uh, fertilizer or uh, herbicide that you can apply now it's it's too late you either do everything in the spring very early or you do it in the fall after it cools down but you, you really don't want to be doing anything now you're, you're going to run the risk I've got something I'd like to show real quick uh, for sure. the people that uh, took your class on grape Look at this beautiful little grape plant that you got as part of the class. So when when you see one of these things come up, if, if you if you look at our uh, website and it says there's a class and you get a plant, uh, Dr. Lester uh, goes out and gets some beautiful little plants. Uh, this thing is so healthy and looks so nice. And uh, you get two of them if you took the class. You get and, three. Uh, three of them. You get three, three of them, yeah. Little guys. Yeah, uh, and you're in the great business, so uh, it actually pays. I mean, it's it's worthwhile that for about what it would cost to buy these three plants at a, a big box store. You not only got the plants, but you got the education and and know all about how to take care of them, and you're all set to start making your own wine or whatever. In fact, you may even want to go in the business with uh, the other 600 people that have opened wineries <laughs> now. Seems to be a great thing here. And it is good. We do make a good wine. So, uh, yeah, muscadines are really that. easy to grow here. And you can grow muscadines pesticide free. 
I mean, they have so few problems. And I actually, well, when I was doing vegetation management at Swift Mud, I'd run into muscadines just growing in the wild all the time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just, and I know there's no one spraying pesticides on those. It'd be, you know, massive pines all, uh, all in the middle of nowhere where like, how did wow. this even get out of here? But for people in the Ocala area North, uh, as I understand it, the bears like those things. Hmm. Um, we got a uh, few of them around here, not a lot they're, in they're Hernando not really County. A problem here. We've got a very, very small population, but that, that might be something to think of if, if you live uh, next to the, the forest east of Ocala. No, yeah. yeah, I know Teresa keeps an eye on all the bears around here in Hernando County. So, some on the east side of the county, where yeah. back away from Brooksville and Spring Hill. When I lived in Sumter, driving through there, I'd seen them several times uh, on State Road 50. Funny enough, when when I first started work at the airport, we were in the process of, of supplying an airplane to a graduate student uh, Michael Orlando, who is now head of the bear thing for the state, but uh, Mike would go out and tag all the bears. And they they had this really neat bear trap, a big round thing, that, uh, like a big tanker with a drop door on it. And they would bait the tanker and uh, the bears go in and, and they would just drop the door and then they'd sedate them and put a collar on them. And I asked him one time what they used. And he said, oh, he said, we've got the greatest attractant there is. He said, bears love donuts. He said, for a dozen donuts, I can get two bears. <laughs> so, next time you have a donut, think about some poor bear somewhere that got yeah. to escape because you're eating his trap. <laughs> okay, let's go back and roll through some questions and comments here. This goes back to the uh, palm tree seeds off of queen palms and marie says her dog keeps wanting to eat them shouldn't be harmful i uh, going back to the uh sand spurs we had a dog who used to like to eat sand spurs or chew mm. on them. <laughs> tough dog sydney's tried growing golden berries also known as cape gooseberries not too familiar with them. i have heard of them um Probably something great to experiment with. Uh, you may be too hot for them in Pinellas County, where you live. Don't be afraid to experiment and try something, though. And, Bernie, any advice on perennial peanut? Well, one plant will eventually take over your yard, but you're probably not going to be around to, to see it happen. Um, you, you need uh, to, to spot them. I, I would think you, you would need uh, probably one plant for 18 inches is the absolute minimum to establish. You're gonna you're gonna have to, to get uh, quite a few plants. Once it does get established, it it's uh, pretty easy to take care of. Uh, it needs make sure that it doesn't dry out uh, while you're trying to get it established. That's, that's probably the only thing that's a real problem with perennial peanut. Also, it needs full sun. If, it, if you're in a shaded area, it's not going to work uh, in a shaded area at all. I, I would say probably six hours of sun minimum, uh, eight hours a day uh, for really healthy um, perennial peanut. It's also sold under the name EcoTurf, so uh, if, if you're shopping, uh, you might check the price on both perennial peanut and EcoTurf. Okay, time's starting to run a little late here, so let's go through a couple of these questions and comments quickly. Diana, yes, beauty berries are safe to eat anytime. You can eat them. They're not particularly tasty no you make jelly but you, you add a lot of sugar because sugar fixes everything um amory are you the one who donated your plants to somebody else in the class 
because she's supposed to be coming in today to pick them all up. So glad you enjoyed the class. Yeah, where you live, you should be able to grow muscadines like crazy up there in North Florida. Um, almost Georgia, really, because I think where they grow the most commercially is Georgia. Though they do grow a lot commercially to turn into wine here in Florida. So yeah, muscadines should grow like weeds, and you should get a great crop every year up there. You should have a lot of them. She says, yep, she has a lot in North Florida. And Annette has a question here. I'm in Hernando County. Can we grow garlic in our zone? And what time of the year would be best to start? Yes, you can. I believe, and somebody correct me on this if I'm wrong, it has to be soft neck garlic, not hard neck. So if you're ordering garlic from a catalog, look under soft neck varieties of garlic. It really helps if you put it in the refrigerator for about a month and then plant it in the garden. And it has to grow here during the winter, not during the summer. Garlic's not going to do well during the summer. It does well here. And I know Corey's in Pasco County. This question comes up this time of year, every year. Yes, we can grow garlic. They need fertile soil with consistent water soft neck types that have been cold treated in a refrigerator for six weeks plus this is called cold stratified so that makes the garlic think that it just went through winter and then it gets planted and if it's a soft neck variety or elephant garlic they both grow here in florida you should be able to grow garlic i need to order some and i was going to try it last year and never did so yeah you guys keep on me make sure i order my garlic and get some started just to see if I can grow it. Um, yeah, some of our dogs over the years have been kind of nuts. We had kind of a, a tough one. Her name was Harley and she was uh, showed a lot of determination and used to like to chew on sand spurs. It gave her a sunny disposition uh yeah perennial peanut is slow to take over but during the summer it will grow and spread but if you you know if there's space between them it takes time to grow and spread and totally fill in it'll happen eventually when you get a frost it's pretty much brown then until uh we get back into the high 60s before it starts doing much Tana asks, how do I tell the difference between ornamental banana and good eating bananas? I know this one. Uh, yeah? Oh, okay, I know. Yeah, right, well. right. Big one. Um, edible bananas hang their flowers straight down, and ornamental bananas hang their flowers either like straight out or upright. Um, and you can eat Edi uh, non non edible bananas, but they just taste really bad and don't eat a lot of them or they'll make you sick. But you can eat a couple of them if you're really not sure. You can take a bite and you'll know right away. Boy, I'm surprised. I learned something today. Thank you. <laughs> and that's why Diana says that we are awesome. So thank you. We we love hearing stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I'll be honest. I like the compliments. So it keeps us coming back every Thursday. And Teresa shared a link about from University of Florida about growing garlic. So go ahead and refer to that. And that's going to give you all the specific, specific information for where you live and what kinds of garlic grow here. But it does grow here during the winter. And Marie, you should be able to grow garlic just fine up there in North Florida. Corey has a recommendation for a place called Practical Plants. They have already cold stratified or cold treated garlic there north of Orlando. And Amory, thank you so much about the uh, muscadine class. It was really good. People had lots of great questions and we recorded it. I will over the next week or two send that off and it will end up on Hernando County government. Um, YouTube channel. Let me go ahead and share that. 
and you don't have don't try writing down the link if you just go to youtube there's a little search box up at the top just type in hernando county government and you will find the hernando county government youtube channel i have recorded classes on there lily has over a hundred recorded classes on there colby will have recorded classes on there we're working on that so we're always adding more to that it's a great way if you're new to the area to get a really good education and very good for helping if you if you suffer from insomnia and can't sleep at night watch a couple hours of our classes i guarantee it'll put you to sleep eventually we would like to ask you very nicely and i will put this in the chat also so everybody has a link to go to if you could take just a moment to fill out our short survey and let me let me get in the right spot here and post this in the comments so that link should work for you very 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 short survey asking did you learn anything from watching one of our virtual plant clinics and do you watch them live or recorded or both and for the people who have answered this in the past the vast majority of them watch both live and recorded so it just gives us a little feedback if you've answered this once before don't do it again just one response per person and if you're watching the recording of this please go ahead and click on that and let us know if you've learned something if you enjoy um the virtual plant clinics if you're getting any kind of benefit from it and cindy no this is the same old survey so i just haven't thought to show the link for a while i know we have some new um live participants on here with us so if you could just take a moment and click on that link and fill out our very very short painless survey we appreciate that yeah corey didn't know about the banana flower thing either he learned something new today too so so all of our new viewers can go on there and honestly say i learned something new today so if you ever have a lawn and garden question best way to get in contact with me is through email just shoot me an email send pictures lots of pictures they really help me figure out what the heck is going on you know people will email me sometimes and they start to give me a verbal description of an insect problem and it, it, it's kind of small medium sized and it's black and it has legs and i can't work with that <laughs> try to get some pictures and send them and we can work with that um if you have any Florida friendly landscape kind of questions, please feel free to email Colby there. He's new and his email probably doesn't fill up during the day like mine does. So uh, we'll you'd, be, you'd, you'd be emails. surprised. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't take long, does it? Mm. Um, please be sure to visit our Master Gardener Nursery here is the location here is the address this is in brooksville it's right off of state road 41 uh right behind the hernando county fairgrounds and our master gardener nursery is open from 8 30 in the morning until 11 in the morning on saturday and wednesday now when the weather cools off they'll be open till noon but it's still hot so they leave at 11. don't show up at two minutes to 11. they'll get grumpy because they're hot and they want to go home so so show up bright and early before it gets really hot they have a great selection of florida friendly plants native plants things that are going to grow well in our area not like big box stores that might sell things that grow well in georgia or down in miami because we're not georgia and we're not miami lady emailed me a few weeks ago about her hydrangeas were not doing well and she sent me the names of them, the variety names. And I, I, I wasn't familiar with them, so I Googled them. One of them is a variety of hydrangea. That's a beautiful hydrangea. 
and I looked at where it was rated for and recommended for, like North Georgia on North. So it didn't even, it won't even grow well for Amarine in South Georgia and North Florida. So it was definitely a North variety plant. So we can help you out with those things. Um, I think that's about a plant. Uh oh, what's that? That's an ant. So I I guess they're going to want me to identify it down to species, but uh, it's an alcohol. So. I'll dry it out, stick it under the microscope, and see if we can find out what it is. But it, it's, it's one of the ants. I assume that they're looking to make sure it isn't a termite. We, yeah, yeah, yeah. We get a lot of that. So. And Cindy, you're very welcome. Thanks so much, everybody, for tuning in every Thursday and asking questions and participating. And for anybody watching this recorded, Please feel free to go ahead and put in your comments, give us a like, share these things with your friends. Um, what else can they do? Send us some nice, generous comments, email us your questions, and be sure to tune in again either next Thursday at 10 a.m. live or sometime after that to watch the recording. So, um, Colby, anything else? Did I cover it pretty well? Um, follow my program on Instagram at Hernando FFL and at Facebook at facebook.com slash Hernando FFL program. Send me the um, links and I'll go ahead and um, put it. We'll be sure. able to show them next time. Um, I also have a newsletter that will begin being sent out October the 1st and you can find that in the bio of the Instagram and the Facebook man. page. No, no. Um, but yeah, that's, that's about all I got. Last question, Diana. Um, we teach a lot. I teach a lot of classes on Zoom, so we do use Zoom a lot. We use Facebook Live a lot. But what you see us on here today, with the blocks and being able to show comments and everything else, is a service called Streamyard, and they are great. You can do live streaming. This, what you're watching here today, you would be able to view on our office Facebook page. Our private Facebook group, okay, our is. private Facebook gardening group, well, I'm and also sure. on my YouTube channel. So you can transmit that. live to a number of different channels. It, it so, and it's great. It. It's a lot of fun. Works very well. Looks good. So I need, I need to use this a lot more. Could be. I mean, it's, it's anything's possible, but I don't think it is. So let's go ahead and wrap it up for today. We'll let Bernie get back to work and get some work done here. Oh, no, I bet you I know what that's going to be. Yes, I'm pretty sure that's what it's going to be. <laughs> okay, well, thanks again, everybody. And we will see you back here again next Thursday at 10 a.m. I know I'm going to be here. I assume both, both uh, Bernie and Colby will be here also. Mm -hmm. I'll be here. And if you have any questions, save them up, email me pictures in advance, and we'll go ahead and share them, and we'll figure out what's going on in your lawn and garden. So until then, everybody, thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you again next week. Bye.